to the young people and the black people in this country. We're going to remake this country in the streets. Don't get hung up in this fourth party bullshit. Don't get hung up in peace candidates. Come on, we got to fight it out. We're the only power we can build is back to the base. We got to build a storm base someday. We got to knock those motherfuckers to control this thing. Well, looking outside my window at a 180 air index, I'm Schmitty, and this is Talkin' Schmidt. Today on the show, I have Dan Lactose and Max Ward from the band Spaz, Peninsula boys that added samples and combined hip-hop and the fastest music they could find to create what some call power violence, but let's not put labels on things. Instead, here's a quick little buy-in tip for getting more thrash when record shopping. The Tower Records, not only would you go off the cover, but you'd flip it over and how many songs were on the back probably meant that it was pretty fast. So, you know, like whether it was speed metal or whether it was like fast hardcore, like I would just be like, ooh, man, there's like 20 songs on this. I bet it's going to be pretty good, you know? Hey, just a quick one before we start. If you haven't already done so, please go to the iTunes store or wherever you get this podcast and give the show a five-star rating with a quick little blurb. You know, just a few little words of kindness or whatever you need to put down. But this apparently is the way to get my sponsors coming after me so we don't have to hear that same anchor commercial every week. I did a little research, and apparently that's what it takes. So if you can, please get out there and do that. I'd appreciate it, and I don't ask much, believe me. (laughs) Thanks so much, and here we go. Uh, This is Dan Lactos from Spaz. This is Max Ward from Spaz, and you're You're listening listening to to Talking Schmidt. It's cool, like tonight is the night. Here we go again. Just give it the old cause turn, isn't it? All big dogs in. Schmitty. 96 times, Schmitty. Thanks, Schmitty. We on? Schmitty. Talking Schmidt. That's called going to the hospital, bitch. I'd be <laughs> shitting my pants. Glad. Your Rolodex is fucking deep. It's right. about the one, the one, the one. Who is this guy who thinks he's tough shit? What's up? We're tastemakers. Come on, Schmitty, what the fuck? Let's hear it for Greg Smith. Yeah! All right, we're back here, and this week we're going deep into the 650 history. We got two-thirds of the dudes from the legendary band Spaz. We got uh, Dan Bellary and Max Ward with us this week. What's good, guys? What's going on? What's up, man? Just same old, man. Groundhog's Day times a thousand. (laughs) (laughs) I got my new photo here from uh, a good friend, Kevin Price, sent me of Phil Shaw at Greer Park in uh, Palo Alto, and I'm just blown away. This came in the mail, and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? But uh, yeah, more 650 love right here, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, he he killed that park, man. Dude, like seeing, like seeing no him skip that part, yeah, I was just like... Yeah. It was just natural. It was like built by him and for him somehow. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, let's start like at the very beginning of all this because some little tidbits I know, but I'm going to be honest, there's a lot I don't know. So I may be asking some ignorant questions today, but it's just out of the love and I want to learn. So sp- sp- Stick with me, all you spazaholics out there, because I may <laughs> ask some questions like, how the fuck did you not know that, bro? But uh, anyhow, um, from the very beginning, um, Max, you're from, where were you born and raised? Stanford Hospital. Oh, went to Yeah, went to Menlo Atherton High, got kicked out of there, went to uh, Mid Pen down in Palo Alto. Okay. And my, and my parents... Kept on moving up the peninsula. So first it was like Menlo Park and then Redwood City and then San Mateo. Okay. My brother actually went to Peninsula in San Carlos. I thought it was mid-peninsula, but it was, 
a sister of Mid Peninsula, I guess. No, yeah. And then Dan, you were born in in where? Redwood City. Out Kaiser. No, I was born at uh, Sequoia. Uh, Sequoia. Okay, I was born at Kaiser in Redwood City. Nice. And you went to Woodside High. Yeah. Okay, and were you guys connected before Spaz, or did you meet in the? Ba- How did it all go down? Uh, I knew of Max because I had heard of Plutocracy. Uh, because Plutocracy at the time was kind of a legendary, you know, band in in the Redwood City area, along with uh, their big brother band, Immortal Fate. So I would see the stickers and flyers around and, you know, just be a little kid skating around and be like, wow, what is this? You know, <laughs> I don't know what this is, but it looks really cool. So Max was, you were in Plutocracy. Yeah. Was yeah, that your I, first band or had you done a bunch before that? Uh, I did. I did. A f- I mean, if we can call it that, I did a few projects before that um, in high school. But then Plutocracy, I think I joined them because they were looking for a drummer when I was a junior. So that was like 88, 89, maybe okay. around there. Yeah. And then did Plutocracy. Uh yeah, up until, what, 92, I think, uh, around there, 92, 93. And then, yeah, you know, and it, it's just small world stuff, and particularly, you know, before the internet and stuff, like, you know, both Dan and I would go to uh, CFY Records and House of Faith that was down in Palo Alto, and so, you know, you, you hear about people through those kinds of spots, like record stores or skate shops or whatever, you start seeing stickers, maybe like some graffiti or something, and, you know, it's like the – it's a language that you're learning and you're trying to figure out who's who and whatnot. Yeah, you know? and totally. so like when Dan and I met, it was just kind of like natural. Like we already knew of each other and heard a lot about each other and just like instantly hit it off just because we had so many like shared interests and stuff. Yeah. And, and not just knowing people locally, but we pen palled cause I was really into tape trading and, you know, writing letters. And I did a, I did a zine and uh, we realized that we wrote to a lot of the same people. No way. <laughs> like all over the country. You yeah. Know? Okay. Did and here you, we were living in the same city, you know, like. Yeah. And was Plutocracy, like, were you playing shows? Yeah, we played shows. So we were playing, you know, it was right when Grindcore kind of like was started. And so it was right after the first like early Napalm Death Records. And we were influenced. I mean, first it was like punk rock, hardcore. And that was fast. But then we just progressively got faster over time. But at that time, people hated that stuff. You know, I mean, this is the time of like, you know, Green Day and Sam I Am and stuff Uh like that. And so they're, they're, you know, we were just, you know, we weren't getting booked and we had to set up our own shows. And so, again, it was like that tight knit, when you connect with people, like you just have this real tight knit circle because that's all you had, right? You know? Yeah. Um, But yeah, we did, we did some shows. We played like Pony Express pizza a lot in Redwood city. Sick. Yeah. Yeah, And then played, um, I saw RKL there and verbal abuse. I saw saw RKL and verbal (laughs) abuse. (laughs) I I was at those shows, man. Yeah. Pony Express was our spot. Cause I went to Sequoia, which was like right across the street. So, uh, Oh, and so you were fan or you knew of uh, discontent. Those were my homies. Dude, Discontent. I mean, those were the guys, like, that was the local band that I, like, looked up to. You know, it was Discontent and Vomit from San Carlos. Yeah, Scott Hill. You know, yeah, you know. <laughs> so, like, uh, yeah, seeing those shows at the Pony Express, like, yeah, you know, I mean, it was super uh, influential for me. And then and then we started playing there ourselves. Okay, so what happens? You guys are, how do you guys, like, actually meet up and discuss starting spaz or i'm i'm assuming the three of you guys were the original it was just you three right it was initially me and max oh, okay uh trying to just kind of come up with something um we were kind of influenced by some bands that were playing really fast hardcore that was not metal um and you know, we were just kind of wanting to do this like super fast, super short, like really intense, like blasts, you know? Um, But, but initially really how we linked up was through my zine. 
Oh. And I, I met the guitar player, uh, Thomas of Plutocracy uh, in high school and, uh, you know, showed him my zine. And he was like, oh, you know, can you put this ad for our demo in, in your zine? And I was like, sure. So I did. And then I gave him a copy and I think he showed it to Max. No. In the meantime, I had been given uh, like either a plutocracy rehearsal. I don't know if the, the flexi was out yet, but, um, you know, we were all kind of doing, it seems like it was such a long period of time, but you know, when Max saying he joined plutocracy in like 88, 89, I mean, I'm talking, this is like maybe two years later, you know? Oh. And um, yeah, so I had a band called Sheep Squeeze and we had recorded it with Bart at House of Faith. Yeah, sick. Um, and, uh, you know, I used to go to CFY every weekend and hang out with Eugene Robinson, um, you know, and he really kind of was one of the, he was actually the adult figure that I met who was like, you know, keep making music. This is good. Huh. You guys are on the right track, you know? And it's like, whoa. Um, so he introduced me to Bart and we set up a recording session and we recorded a Sheep Squeeze studio session and that ended up coming out as a seven inch that me and my buddy Chris put out ourselves. And I know that like, you know, I had traded, I think the seven inch for the flexi with Thomas at, at school. Cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's, it's like high school, high school connections, you know, and stuff. Wow. It's I mean, cool, Bart's yeah. been doing it forever, huh? Oh yeah, Bart. Bart's the king, man. He is you the know? king. His ear is yeah. insane, right? Is crucial he, part yeah. of Spaz. Yeah, very crucial part. Oh, did yeah. he record all of Spaz too? Yeah. Almost all of it. Almost uh -huh. all. Of it. Yeah, we had the privilege of working with him too, with Marty and those guys, and uh, it was one day in, one day out, and he did like, I believe, seven or eight tracks, and it was just like, dude, I was like, this guy is like doing it super fast, like. I knew that he was sick, but I was like, don't we need, maybe we need another take? No, no, no. We got this. We got this. And he's like, do, do, do. And by the end of the day, he gave us, I was like, what the fuck? And it was, <laughs> made us sound better than we've ever sounded for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, Bart, Bart, you know, makes that connection, that generational connection too, going all the way back to Whipping Boy and like recording a lot of the old Palo Alto bands like Armistice. I think he did PLH and some other bands as well. Right. You know, and was like the elder. So just like how Dan was saying with Eugene, you know, there was these elders from the first iteration of punk hardcore on the peninsula, you know, Ron Issa, Bart, you know, all these people that kind of then, you know, brought us up and kind of showed us the way, you know, and Bart, you know, being a, a recording engineer was just instrumental for that, just constantly like supporting us, giving us deals because like we were basically like pooling our allowances, you know, to do it and stuff. We, yeah. we used to rehearse in, in the old live room at House of Faith. So we'd figure out, you know, he'd be doing a mix down. So he wouldn't be using that part of the studio. And Max had his drums in the closet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So nice. we'd pull the drums out and then that's where Spaz would rehearse. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Th thank you, Bart. And <laughs> did the sound, so did the sound evolve as the band played or did like, this is kind of a new, what, 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 how do you describe it? What do you call it? Is it called power violence? Is that the name of it or what is it? We called it hardcore power violence kind of, was a uh, phrase our buddy Eric Wood coined, you know, later or maybe around the same time, but it was never really applied to us as a sound. It wasn't really like we were trying to sound power violence because in my mind, power violence bands that he calls power violence, none of them sound the same. Uh -huh. You know, it's more of a, of a, of a mental state maybe oh. a mind mindset of, of how you create the music and, and, I, I would guess, you know, I don't really know how to explain it. Yeah. And, and we were influenced by, you know, again, going back to like old Oxnard bands, DRI, Attitude Adjustment, you know, stuff like that. But for the early 90s, just trying to like push that further to the extreme. And we were influenced by bands like Crossed Out and Infest and some of these really, really fast bands. But, you know, a lot of these categories get in the way because what they, they, 
they break apart the connections of how things evolve naturally, you know, to now like, Oh, now, now there's this scene called power violence and these bands fall under that category. But uh-huh. actually, you know, it just goes back to basically, you know, really fast, aggressive, hardcore punk from the early eighties, you know, and that's what influenced us and, you know, continues to do so. And then as, is it just only natural that the songs are going to be short because you're giving it all you can and you can't keep <laughs> this up for that long? We don't want, we don't want to get bored. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why play it four times when you could play it two times or once? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and also it was all about sides of records too. So like, if you think about like, you know, a song hip hop or pop or whatever, you know, it's a song, it's a self-contained song. But like, when you think of a record, like a hardcore record, you think of like a side of an EP or something. So you're thinking about the spacing between the songs, samples, if there's samples or whatever, or just connecting everything. So, you know, it was as much about composing individual songs, but also putting them together in such a way that the minute you put the needle down, it's just like you're just being hit over the head with a hammer until, you know, the side ends. And and so you're thinking about the whole kind of editing, you know, together of the songs as well. Because it's definitely like a seven inch medium, yeah. you know, right. like it's, it's, it, 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 it just works best in that format. So what do you got? Eight minutes, like four minutes aside. No. So, you know, how can you get the biggest bang for your buck? Well, you know, you put, 12 songs on that motherfucker <laughs> <Yeah. Right. laughs> you know? back to back no spaces yeah. but to go back to like kind of the beginning and you know after we initially met and stuff um it was just me and max in my parents garage trying to figure this out really you know um and so the initial like material the the first as material was mostly written by you know i wrote most of the riffs and uh, me and Max arranged and Max, I think, wrote a couple riffs, but it was very much just like me and Max um, at that point. So it's all instrumental at that point? Well, we didn't know what we were going to do uh-huh. as far as vocals. We had asked somebody who said they were going to sing and then they had a kid uh, in high school. Okay. So he was like, I can't do this. Right. Uh, then we tried to convince the bass player from 976 and uh, Plutocracy, Dan Hogan, to sing because his vocals were just so brutal. Big boy. And we uh-huh. were like, man, we really want you to sing for our project because at the time it was a project. Okay. You know, like we were just kind of, let's record this, you know, demo is what we we're, how we were looking at it. And, um, and then we'll figure it out, you know, from there. Okay. We never, we never thought that it was going to turn into what it did. I mean, there was no aspirations for that at all. It, and again, get, getting back to the importance of zines at the time, there was an interview with Atmosphere Zine that was out of uh, Newark, Fremont area. Dennis Collin did it, uh, where I mentioned that Dan and I had this project and that in Chris Dodge, who was up in San Francisco, read that interview and said, yo, if you want a basis, I'd like to join, you know, because I want to do a project like this. And, and we were like honored like that Chris Dodge you know, wanted to join. And so, and then that was, that was how it was completed. But again, it's, it's this kind of communication through zines and trading and. Right. Okay. Um, And Plutocracy was still going at the same time. Plutocracy was just concluding. There was just a little bit of overlap when Dan and I were writing songs in his parents' garage. I think, I think Pluto was still playing, but but we we had decided to to call it uh so yeah there was just a little bit of overlap i think it was 92 92 because i remember going to some plutocracy practices and when everybody would take a break to like go out and smoke and stuff you know max would sit stay at the drums and i'd be like cool if i use this amp real quick you know and we'd (laughs) we'd start, you know, uh-huh. working on our stuff, which <laughs> probably didn't make those guys feel too good at the time. But yeah, you know, it was just like me and Max were just so pumped on this new idea. We were like really, really driven, yeah. you know, to, to, to make this music. Um, were you going to punk shows or was it more even harder that was punk kind of soft compared to what you guys were doing? <laughs> well, I mean, it just depends on the genre within that, but you know, you could, I mean, the, the the first DRI, you know, the Dirty Rotten EP, 22 songs. I mean, it basically all starts and ends there. I mean, okay. you can think of like grindcore and you can think of power violence and you can think of whatever. And it kind of, it's really that EP. 
you know, so there was older influences like DRI, Siege, HHH, uh, Protest Bank, to what whatnot. But at the time, it was also um, bands that were just forming or had been playing for a couple of years that were really playing fast, which was, again, it was really shunned by the scene at the time. So bands like Capitalist Casualties and Crossed Out, Infest, uh, the projects like Neanderthal that, w- that were down south. And so that was really influential uh, for us. Um, but, you know. But it, also, but, like, most of those records were being put out by Chris Dodge's label, Slap a Hand. Yeah. So he oh. was, like, feeding us the inspiration before he was in the band. So Chris Dodge is well known by you before you, I mean, maybe you oh, don't yeah. know him as a friend, but you know who he is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, he was he was the only person who was putting out that stuff, you know, at the time and uh and it was a small scene, but you know, when Slapaham put out an ad in MR with some upcoming EP, you know, there was probably, you know, 500 600 people distributed throughout the world, you know, who would just be like, "Oh shit, like I'm ordering that right now." You know, and Dan Dan and I and a few other people on the peninsula were also you know, those kinds of people where it wasn't like a huge scene, mm. but it was super dedicated because it was really rare for somebody at that time to be putting out that kind of music. Right. Especially in the USA. Yeah, especially England in the US. was a little, they were already kind of doing it with like earache records, you know, on a bigger scale, but that sound of just really abrasive, fast, loud, heavy stuff, that was, that you know, that was really going on over there more than here. Okay. You know? Um, and so then when Chris comes down, there's not really a tryout. You're just like, dude, you're in or like, how does it work? <laughs> <laughs> How did it work? Dan? I, I think what happened is, um, I'm trying to remember if me and you already had a recording date. I feel like we did. No, I feel maybe. like we already had a date booked and we were kind of working towards finalizing our set of songs. And, um, when Chris hit us up, it was prior to that. And I think Max gave him a, a tape of one of our rehearsals, you know, and was like, well, this is what we're doing, you know, and it was pretty, pretty basic, you know, I mean, I, at the time I was, I'd never played in a band with somebody who could play drums like Max, you know, I was in just like straight up four chord punk rock, you know, mid tempo stuff. Yeah. So I was trying to move, like get better at playing faster. And so, you know, that first recording we did is really simple, uh-huh. you know? Um, and I think Chris just learned it by listening to it at home. Cause when we hooked up to play for the first time, it was like, Oh wow. It, you know, it's like, this would sound like most bands 10th rehearsal, you know? <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember, yeah, when Chris started playing, like, I just kept on thinking, like, man, this is going to be too rudimentary for him, you know? It's, like, so, <laughs> it's so simple, you know, yeah, because totally. he, had been, he had been in bands, like, Sticky and, like, other bands, and, you know, he he was a little older than us, too, so he was, like, an older generation that we looked up to and stuff, and then once he joined, it was so clear, like, he was just like, yeah, I learned these songs and just, like, played them more, like okay, you know what you're doing, <laughs> you know? And, and he had a lot of influence like he, the, the, as the sound evolved. It was kind of apparent like early on that our chemistry was really good. Yeah. Like we, we were laughing through like all the practices, you know, that's why all the song titles and stuff are so silly because, I mean, we, we just had so much fun. Right. You know, making this music and just you know everybody wrote riffs like max wrote a lot of riffs and i mean there was often times where we'd all switch instruments and we'd try to write songs you know with like chris on drums and max on guitar and me on bass and you know we did kooky stuff like that switch yeah. it up yeah did, and so and chris was doing the vocals as well yeah so in the studio we all did vocals oh okay so yeah, on the it- records we're all singing yeah, one one of the one of the secrets about the band. I, I get this. I get asked this sometimes. Uh, we wrote the lyrics the night before, literally. So what we do, we go into the studio, and lay down the music, and then you know the next day we'd all come in and we had divvied up who wrote the lyrics for what and and how it was going to be separated out, and we literally just taped it to the wall with all of us with three microphones, you know, like basically reading the lyrics off the wall and, you know, somebody would be like, okay, this is your part. That's your part. Okay. We're going to alternate on the course. But like, we didn't, we didn't 
you know, sit down. Never and, practiced it. <laughs> no, yeah, we never practiced <laughs> it. Yeah, and, and it actually came out okay. I mean, it came out like on the fly. Like it actually sounds like pretty chaotic and and uh, and and good upon listening. But yeah, the secret is we just we wrote them really the night before. You know, a little freestyle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Huh. So what was the first, what was the first recording? The seven inch on, um, slap a ham, which was going to be a demo actually. Uh, what Dan was saying, how we had a recording at house of faith. Uh, and, uh, and Chris liked the, the recording enough where he was like, Hey, I'm just going to put this out on slap a ham. And I think both Dan and I are like, are you serious? Uh-huh. Like, yeah, we're like, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that, once once it goes out into the public that's like when you actually start getting kind of nervous like you're like oh shit like people are gonna like hear this you know listen to it <laughs> right you know but chris was pumped and we're like okay you know it, you know do it and and yeah he put out the first seven inch which basically should have been our demo but yeah it uh-huh. became a seven inch yeah how ma- do you know how many of those got maybe like two thousand there was two pressings huh back then you'd press a thousand seven inches that was kind of the you know the norm and do you do you get some feedback or does it take a while uh are you doing more recordings like are you initially are people tripping or is it take a minute you know i don't i don't really remember um you know uh we definitely i do know that we definitely started working on writing stuff all together because it was kind of like Chris joined. We were like, wow, this is a good fit, but this is stuff me and Max wrote together. Like, let's write some stuff, all three of us, you know, cause it's going to be way better. Okay. Yeah, and, I, and, and I think if you, if you listen to the recordings in sequence that like, it took us a couple of years to like really kind of find our, d- gel together and find our sound. But you know, those first couple of recordings were kind of experiments as far as like, what works, what sounds good, you know, what are we good at? What are we not good at? What didn't work and stuff. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think this goes with most bands. We put out all that stuff. So even as we were trying to figure <laughs> out what we were doing, you know, some of the earlier records, you know, don't sound as good, I think, as, as you know, the, the later records. But, um, you know, but that's bands. You're just trying to figure out, you know, what works and what what you're specifically doing even you know sure. we we definitely documented everything you know how like throbbing gristle like put out they recorded and put out every show you know it's like we kind of recorded and put out every song we wrote yeah you know basically right. um and and the second and third recordings i think we were still kind of coming to the table with whole songs that one of us had written mm after that there was like a lot more collaboration on almost every song it was probably rare for somebody to write an entire song you know by the time we got to you know the second album right the samples like b movies and kung fu all that stuff were you guys into hip hop oh yeah did that yeah. kind of like how did that mentality i mean plutocracy did it <laughs> <laughs> oh plutocracy was doing it Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and those, those guys like influenced me and turned me on to like a lot of like Bay area, what would now be called gangster rap, I guess, you know, but like that was all underground. And like, once, you know, once you start seeing and like recognizing, you know, that this is what we're doing, we're, we're putting out our own records, doing our own shows. And that's what these dudes are doing too. You know, they're, they're basically trying to kind of that community of passing your tape along. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. And, and some of it was political. I mean, you know, again, this is like Rodney King riots, you know what I mean? And so like there was, it's, it, I mean, you know, it seems so silly to think now we're like in the middle of it again, you know, but like, right. it was just the, uh, you know, the politics were kind of the same, you know, we were like constantly. Paris was yeah. really big. Paris was so sick. I was just yeah. in, right when the um, George Floyd thing happened, I threw Paris in on loop and it's still so sick. Yeah. He's coming out with like, a new album. Do, 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 the <laughs> fucking energy, like I mean, in the J card of like the first tape, it's like a history lesson, yeah. man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And him, you know, he was educated, you know, through I think it was UC Davis, I think. Oh wow. Uh, if, if yeah, I can't remember, but you know, he knew his shit and like 
you know, if you listen to It Takes a Nation of Millions to hold us back, you yeah. know, I mean, that also, like, you know, Chuck D, you know, clearly, uh, you know, laid out a lot of history and like, you know, yeah, what was Farrah going on. the prophet and I think you ought to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. So, you know, you got like plutocracies, you know, before, you know, before I'm in the band with Max, I'm, you know, I, I'm listening to this unreleased plutocracy album and, you know, they're sampling Malcolm X and, you know, MC Poo. And I'm, it's just like, holy shit, you know, like stinkweed, rest in peace. Rest in peace. The way that his brain can connect everything that he liked, you know, and, and, and then he would kind of take ownership of that sound, you mm-hmm. know, and that was a really inspiring uh, energy. To, to me and yeah. and i think with spaz you know we just kind of carried it on okay you know, as okay. far as the sampling and and just taking things out of context and creating the new <laughs> crazy spaz stew of you know whatever yeah and and the, and the hong kong stuff too was you know dan and i were going down to uh independent theater down in san jose every tuesday night for you know hong kong you know, these reels would travel. They'd stop in San Jose. By Thursday, they were up in Berkeley. I, I don't think they went through San Francisco, but basically it was just all the early John Wu, Choi Hark, you know, th- these kinds of films. And the only way that you could see them, there was no VHS tapes or anything like that, was like if you went to these theaters. Yeah. And so so we would go down there um, and check them out. And, uh, and, I was recording, uh, was it Kung Fu Theater on Channel 26? Kung Fu Theater, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I would I'd record, I'd set my VCR to record, you know, Kung Fu Theater at like 1 a.m. or whatever, and like, we just pull samples off that, you know, and it was also at the time, you know, that Wu, Wu-Tang dropped, you know, so then all of a sudden there's this like language, right, of like say, Hong yeah. Kong references and stuff, you know. Hey, um, this thing, for some reason, I guess when I do multiple people, it times out. Oh, okay. 45 minutes. Uh, let me turn this off and then just invite you guys right back. Okay. 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 Thanks. And now another first impression with Timothy Donald McKenney. First impression of spaz. That's pretty much when I say spaz, it's more like Dan lactose and Max. And I think I probably met the guys due to my best friend starting to date Max. And uh, shout out Grace Barrels. I love you more than all the girls in the world. I love you. You're up on the top with them. Uh, Because of her, she started dating Max. And because of that, I got to go and skate with them at their underground spot. I don't know if it was uh, Menlo Park or I think it might have been Mountain View But it was one of the malls down there, one of those strip malls, and it was the underground parking lots. And they had a a wax red curb. And we'd go skate it every once in a while. And it was just a mellow, cool, super cool sesh every time. It was just super fun, maybe up to 10 times. But I remember meeting up with Dan. He had had his parents' house. He was at his parents' house. They had a nice big house uh, next to the Safeway, I think, across the street or something. And then Max lived in the condos or some cottages uh, down closer to the Elko. But we'd meet up with him, thanks to Grace, and we'd go and have sessions. Shout out, Barrels. I love you for life. Thanks. Yo, Max, I was, uh, we were talking for a few minutes before he came in, and I was like uh, talking about Woodside Plaza, Rainbow Records Curb, and how it's kind of like when we first like linked up and we were yeah, skating. Yeah. And- yeah. Dude, he worked at the fucking round table. Oh, really? Right in the corner there? Yeah. At the same time. Oh, at the same time? Around the time. It's like, what the hell? Yeah, that's crazy. (laughs) So we're back. Um, Yeah, it's crazy uh, that this thing is super wonky. I I think I paid like money to to have it time out. And it's still, (laughs) so I got to look into that after this fucking thing. Anyway, I don't know how long this, this is after that, but obviously the cool Keith reference um, (laughs) has to be massive. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's all Neil Nordstrom. We had a friend who lived with the automator and uh, ultramagnetic MCs fans. And, uh, and here our friend Neil was like, yo man, cool. Keith is like recording this project with my roommate. 
And we were just like, what? You know, like, I mean, that was like mind blowing, you know, and Dan was lucky enough where he had time to be able to get up there and go meet him. I think you got some, I, I think I gave you my UMC poster to sign. He signed it, right? I think. I think something. so. I brought some stuff to sign. Yeah. Um, where, where is this at? So it was actually at Automator's parents' house. This is before he lived with, with Neil. But the Automator, oh, oh. Dan the Automator and, um, and Neil Nordstrom, like, have been friends since kindergarten or something. And where do they live? San Francisco. Oh. Yeah. So um, Neil is uh, not in a band. He's just a real huge fan of, like, extreme music. So he's a, got an insane record collection. He wrote for Maximum Rock and Roll. Mm. Um, just went to tons of shows. And, um, I mean, just an insane resource, you know, as far as you know, that, that kind of, uh, extreme music. So he's mentioned a lot in Spaz <laughs> lyrics. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he's like the fourth, the fourth member of Spaz for sure. Play the drinking and, game where yeah, every time yeah. you hear his name, you got to take a shot. There basically, you go. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So he, he, I guess called Max one night and was like, Hey, you know, um, Dan says it's cool for you guys to come through and meet Keith tonight. And, uh, I guess Max was busy. And Max called me and I was like, oh, holy shit. So I just hopped in my car and, and drove up to San Francisco and met him. No yeah. way. <laughs> That's cool. And then I, you know, cool. they were recording a song. They took a break. Um, you know, I'm sitting on the automator's bed, you know, like just kind of listening to them track their song up. And he kind of had like a, a attic in the like above the closet of his room and the closet was the vocal booth and in the attic part was like you know where dan was sitting with his you know pro tools rig so right. you know I, I listened to that for a while and then they took a break and keith comes out and neil kind of introduces me to him and he's like oh yeah you know you like porn <laughs> and i'm like yeah you know uh, it pulls out this duffel bag man it's like <laughs> this big and he just unzips it and it's just packed with vhs no and he way. just starts handing me vhs he's like have you seen this one you know <laughs> this guy like you know like and i'm just like whoa man. wow <laughs> uh, cool case stories and so you know we just kind of you know uh i don't know i think yeah i got him to sign some stuff and um you know just kind of totally awkward moment where it's like, I don't know what to say to this guy, you know? Yeah. And, uh, He's a trip, and huh? I think Neil's like, yeah. And Neil's like, you know, Oh, Dan's in this band, you know, called uh, spaz. And he was like, Oh yeah. You know, do you guys sound like gore fest? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> He's like, are you guys like heavy, like autopsy? And I was like, well, we're not really death metal. We're like really fast. And I was like, actually I have our new recording in my pocket. Like I could play some of it for you. So Automator throws it in the tape deck and plays it. And Keith's like, I like this. I like this. Can you come in and make this guitar sound on this record we're working on right now? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, when do you need me to do that? You know? No way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we talked and I got Automator's number. And um, I was like, oh, my God, this is crazy, you know. And I was like, hey, you know, man, Keith, it'd be awesome if you could do a, a drop you know, for, for this album we're working on. And uh, we re -round, rewound that tape and uh, Automator hit record and Keith did his drop. And it's funny, if you listen close to that part on, because we have him on our record. So I recorded the drop and it, if you listen to the Spaz record with the Keith drop, if you listen really close to when he starts talking, like, you know, it, the tape ha hadn't started running yet he's already like talking and it kind of cuts in because <laughs> uh, I think automator was like, get out of here, man. Like, you know, you're <laughs> you show up with a tape. You're like, now you're going to be on this album or something, you know? And that came out before he, the record where he mentions us. Yeah, we well, heard I, about that, but was we were that like, Dr. What? Octagon. Yeah. yeah. The songs yeah. I'm destructive. Yeah. It's so funny. Def Leppard and spaz. Yeah. Def Leppard autopsy and spaz. Yeah. So we got a call a couple days later. I think Neil called Max and said, hey, you know, Keith mentions you in, in a song. It's like, what? Really? Nah, leave you, you know. And then we heard the record. <laughs> but is your guitar in it? 
No, that never came through, man. Uh, uh, somebody say, else I plays guitar that, but... on that record. Um, but yeah, I tried. I called a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, it never it never happened. Oh man. So is that like what period of your guys being a band is that? Is that beginning, middle, end, or kind of the middle? Middle, like 95, oh. 96, maybe, right? So that's a huge highlight. Yeah, because uh the the Keith drop on the Spaz record is on our second album. Okay. What's that one called? La Revancha. La Revancha. And then the other uh you know thing that really struck me is I'm looking through the uh compilation appearances and I see the old title Billy Pepper's Fist in the Glass <laughs> Eye of Jake Phelps. Yeah. That that I song mean, was in, that song was inspired by me sitting at one of those city hall SF contests. And every time Billy Pepper got out on the, you know, out on the course, Phelps was just like, fuck Heckle you, Pepper. Yeah, just like, just trying to get in his head. Yeah. And I was sitting behind him and I was like, oh shit, there's some like serious bad blood going on here or something. I don't know what's going on. So then I just came home and it was one of those things you're writing the lyrics the night before. And I was right. like, Oh, you know, drawing inspiration from, you know, what's happened recently. And I, it, that was fresh in my brain, just like thinking like, holy shit, Phelps is like really going after Billy Pepper. No way. <laughs> so, yeah. so you went to those, con the contest in the, in the fountain? Yeah. 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 Sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to the city. Yeah. Back to the city. Wow, man. That's insane. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Like, I think, Max, I, I went maybe, did you live for a minute up off uh, Alameda, like up high, kind of above where the spillway was like 44th or something like that <clears throat> in San Mateo, mm, like Abbott I? school area. Yeah, no, no. I, I felt like there. I went to your house one night with like Chad Blakeney or somebody like, I remember it might've been a different Max, but I thought it was you, but you're friends with uh, McGinley, right? He's a good friend of mine. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so you, so you were Team Yahtzee, right? Well, mm. I was in a band with Marty, and I lived with Marty and Kai, who started Team Yahtzee. But I wasn't in Team. We actually did a parody, which was Team Taco. Oh, Team Taco! Because yeah. you, you know <clears throat> we were the, Redwood City, San Carlos. Those guys were Palo Alto, but we but all you, skated together. But you weren't RCBS. <laughs> That kind of, but not really. Fletch okay. was, that was Fl my friend Fletch. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I was born in Redwood City, but then I, I lived in San Carlos. So it was kind of one of those things. It's kind of like now I moved to San Francisco, but I can't claim it because I'm not originally from here. I sure. don't know. It was always like that for me. I didn't really care. But uh, no, RCBS was those guys deal. It was kind of Craig and uh, Dis Discontent, yep. those guys. <clears throat> but I would roadie for those guys. So I saw, like, did you guys ever, you guys must have went to the varsity, right, to see shows? Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's when I got into... That was, a little, that was before my time. Okay, I got into punk in, <clears throat> I think, 85. And my first show was at the varsity, and then I was at the, I think, I think it was the last show ever at the varsity where the dude did a stage dive and broke his head open. I think it was a uh, suicidal tendencies, uh, ill repute and maybe aggression or something. I forget who it was, but that was like, so eye opening for us. Like I'm a suburban kid. Right. So that is like a huge deal. And then, me and those guys, the RCBS guys, they started to band Discontent. They started playing Cover Wagon and whatnot. And then next thing you know, we're at the Mabuhe Gardens. We're in some club in, I forget what it was called, but it's like Mountain View or Santa Clara down there. They had a club where like Seven Seconds would play. And all these bands would come in and they would open for them. So we were seeing like Bad Brains, RKL, all these you know huge bands for us. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, my friend's band's play with them. This is crazy. So I'm sure it was a similar thing, but you guys were kind of in a, a different world a little bit. What, where, where would you guys play? Played Gilman Street a lot. Gilman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
I mean, I can't really think. There wasn't very many because Spaz only played all ages shows. Right. So we never played any bars. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I'm trying to think of other Bay Area. I mean, we played Cactus Club in San Jose. I think that's what it was, Cactus Club, maybe. Because they would have some. I can't remember the names. I don't know if those were all ages. Those might have been like, you know, 15 and up or something. I, I think but. I think that it, one was 18 and over. That one that followed the Fiesta okay. Grande were like slight slappers from Japan okay. played and stuff. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there was really no, I mean, and honestly, I mean, it was even hard for us to get shows at Gilman Street. Yeah. Really? Because we just didn't fit in with, with yeah. any of the local happenings, you know? And a friend of ours who actually moved uh, to the Bay from Alabama named Ken Sanderson who does a label called Prank Records. Uh, he started booking at Gilman and he started booking bands that were coming through, you know, when they'd be on tour, like a band that was really heavy or fast or something in bands. So it was always Capitalist Casualties and Spaz because okay. there was no one else. Huh. No. Um, and so that we ended up getting to play on some killer bills. I mean, first spaz show <laughs> that we ever played was with Chaos UK. Yeah. And the second was <laughs> the, the second was Rorschach. You know, I mean, it was just like yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, so, see, that's how it was back then, though. Like now, like it's everything's so much more big. But I was talking to Brian Brannon from JFA. And he's like, yeah, our first show is with Black Flag. I'm just yeah. like, first show, Black Flag. Like, <laughs> where do you go? <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Well, hey, Black Flag's coming through town and they need opening bands, man. So start a band. That's you know what, what I he mean? was saying. And he's in, <laughs> he's in Phoenix. So like, you know, whatever. Um, but it's still, you're just like on paper. That's like a grand slam, man. Like, yeah. damn. Uh, what was, was there any like crazy incidents with that much aggression and like that, you know, did, what were the crowds like? Was there a lot, was there violence or were there just gnarly pits? Like what, what was the scene like? I, you know, compared to before, before we started the recording, you know, we had been talking about the farm and stuff. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, when I would go up to the farm, and you'd have to walk through the park, you know, where the skins were and stuff, the skinheads yeah. and, you know, and they just fucking be fucking with people. And I was too young to be fucked with, but I watched the people in front of me who right. just got off the bus, you know, get fucked with. And I remember a lot of just crazy stuff at that shows. And so by the time that we came about and we were playing, like things had mellowed out like quite a bit. And so even though, you know, with this category power violence, and even though the music was like really extreme, like, you know, the worst thing that happened was like somebody stage dived at a club that you weren't supposed to stage dive at or something like that. But, you know, oh. it was not, it was nothing like, Oh, some dude just got stabbed in the bathroom kind of stuff, which happened, you know, on a weekly basis at some of the shows that I would go to in the eighties. So, right. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Uh, you know, it just depended on the neighborhood, um, that you were playing. Uh, yeah. Did you frequent the farm a lot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What What are some shows that stick out to you that you remember as like some highlights? Uh, well, so I saw uh, Coc and the Bad Brains. Um, you know, I, at that time I was really into the local bands, and so I was really into like Day on the Farms or Day at the Farm or whatever they were. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so you'd see like Attitude Adjustment and Corrupted Morals and Slambodians and like things like that, and th those were the kinds of bands that I was into. But, you know, I saw like, uh, saw Youth of Today, actually the first time that they toured and, you mm -hmm. know, the, which was crazy. Uh, uh, saw um, Seven Seconds, like right before New Wind came out. I saw DRI right before Crossover came out. And that was like, that was the show that I was so excited for. And they started opening with some crossover <laughs> songs, you know, and I was just no. like, you know, my little like 12 year old brain was trying to like compute, like, wait, they're not as fast yeah. as they were, they were on the record, you know, <laughs> but it was those shows and also varsity shows too, you know, so my sister used to take me to varsity shows. And so, you know, if anything, the influence was kind of like from Menlo Park South. And so, you know, huh. like Team Yahtzee would set up those like skate jams behind 7-Eleven. Yeah, Lighten, you know? every Sunday. 
Yeah, every Sunday. So that was a huge influence for me. Shows at the Varsity, but like Team Rasta and Mountain View and, you know, just the the punks and the skaters from that area. Dude, you know, there were like, so many teams back then yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, for skateboarding. This like anti-team, you know, it's like, why yeah. are we making teams? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're not a sport, but damn it. We're going to form yeah, a team. We're have teams. A team. Yeah. Team taco. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it was a, a tongue in cheek thing, but I, for, those jams behind Seven Eleven were, Dude, huge was, for me too yeah. and i was talking to someone recently too and you guys probably can uh relate to this as a young kid without an iphone or any of this digital world that we did not have back then how the fuck i got from san carlos to montague banks in san jose with three <laughs> different bus transfers i don't really know <laughs> like it was like word of mouth like you know, you yeah. met a bro in Palo Alto and he's like, take the 7B to this exit, get off and then get on this bus. And you're just like going with it. Like, I think this is right, but they could have took you to Tijuana and you would have been like, ah, oh, they said the <laughs> bank's wrong. You know? Yeah, totally. So it was crazy though. Like Montague was so far from us, uh, fish banks, like all those fish iconic yeah. spots that were down there that we didn't have a car and no one to drive us. So we had to rely on the bus and I don't know, man, the transfers and all that stuff. I, I know people in New York are going, welcome to our world or whatever. But <laughs> like, dude, it was like, you know, fuck. Um, yeah. And you mentioned like seeing people on the bus, like you said, you'd run into the guy from Ribsy or something yeah. like, holy shit. Like, yeah, you know, that's th how these I were kind of uh, like, uh, larger than life personalities in our world that no one else would know who's Ribsy. It's like, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So it That's was how cool. I met Phil Xiao. No, on the bus? On the bus. Yeah. I was already on the bus with my skateboard, hanging with my buddy Jake, and Phil got on and walked right up to us and was like, hey, what's up, guys? My name's Phil. You know, like it Nicest was just guy. You, back then you'd see somebody with a skateboard and, you know, you'd look, be like, all right, this guy really skates. And it's like, this is my homie. Yeah. Right. Same, same for me. I, uh, I think we were coming, we were either going to the farm or coming back from the farm. So it goes all the way up, um, El Camino to one area and then gets on the freeway. And we picked up these guys from San Mateo that had skateboards in their hand. And it later was, I found out this was Joe Raposo who oh, played oh, bass shit. in RKL. Like yeah, he yeah. was my good friend, uh, and Mike Alcantar. And, we had never skated a pool yet at this time. And they're like, Hey, you guys want to go skate a pool? And we're like, huh? A pool. What do you mean? <laughs> like, you know, like, yeah, but huh? And they're like, Oh, cappuccino <laughs> high school is drained. Like we're, we're going there tomorrow. Meet us at, at one. So we skated this high school, uh, drain pool for the, that was the first pool I ever skated with Alcantar and Raposo and like maybe one other guy from San Mateo. And then we just hit it off and became super good friends. Like I ended up working at Go Skate on 41st with those dudes. And yeah, it was like a huge, like that time created who I am. Absolutely. Like the punk music, the skating and the peninsula, like, and eventually finding San Francisco and San Jose. But we were doing a lot of shit in the 650, you know? Yeah. So yeah, the, the, the covered wagon, I mean, dude, when I think it was verbal abuse was playing, the the Chinese lady that ran the place was hitting people with her flashlight, like, no slab dancing. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. If somebody has any video footage of any of that, please email it to me because I'm so down. I yeah, think yeah. Uh, somebody was telling me they saw like uh, Dave Cotter or somebody had a recording of it. And he's like, I think you're in the front. Like, and I was like, dude, send that to me. I want to see that stuff. Yeah, I remember some of the shows there. They they forced you to sit on the benches and you couldn't stand up. Right. Do you remember that? And so like <laughs> yeah. you'd be sitting there. What, I mean, it was so weird. It was so <laughs> surreal, you know, but they were like trying and they had their security standing on both sides. And so you're sitting on these like benches watching like a super aggressive hardcore punk band going off in front of you and you, and you were forced to sit, you know. It was so weird, man. Totally. So what happened at the end? Like, why did the band stop? Well, Chris ended up moving. That was kind of one of the main reasons. But we had actually kind of, it kind of petered out before we stopped, where we just, uh, 
we were each doing other things. You know, Max had some other bands. Um, and Chris had other bands and I was, I had actually gotten really into, uh, making beats. Mm. I really wanted to do hip hop production, you know, which oh. I've been doing for a while. Um, but that was kind of when I was really trying to get into it. Right. Um, so like my, my listening taste had kind of changed, you know, where I wasn't really following the hardcore stuff as, as much except for my friends that were still doing it, you know, but I didn't really, you know, I, it was kind of like after we did it, our tour in 97, I think we, we kind of burnt out. We yeah. did like a, a seven week tour. And, um, I mean, we played almost every day wow. and, you know, I mean that this, that this style, you know, and doing it, you know, in a very DIY fashion, you know, yeah, I mean, for sure. it, it, it'll wear, <laughs> it'll wear you down. All right. <laughs> Uh, so we got back from the tour and I think we just kind of wanted to take a break from playing the music and probably from each other too, you know? Totally. <laughs> and uh, um, I think what really kind of got us back was we got asked to go uh, tour in Japan yeah. in 98. Oh. And I think between, maybe between the tour and, and that, we had gotten together, you know, to like, maybe handle some band business and we went to our, cause we had a rehearsal space, you know, where all of our gear was mm -hmm. and uh, started playing. And, and I know we were writing some stuff. We had started writing some new stuff and then it just kind of, I think, you know, everybody was so busy. Max was going to school, playing in bands. I was going to school, working full time. And, um, mm. you know, Chris was really busy with the job and multiple bands. And I think it just kind of, you know, well, what are we going to do now, you know, with spaz, yeah. you know? And then we got asked to go to Japan. And so we had to start rehearsing again, you know, to get ready for that. And then that experience was just totally Did they lose unbelievable. Their shit? Yeah. I mean, that was Japan's so inspiring. Best. It 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 rejuvenated us. When we came home, we were like, let's write a record, you know, let's yeah. And that ended up being the last album. Or let's move to Japan. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what this guy did. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's... yeah, I, you know, I mean, that was so crazy, you know, going on that tour. Like, I mean, we played with bands like Gaze and like, just like all the bands that we had loved for so uh -huh. long and that influenced us like every night, you know, they, they, were, they were playing with us. And I, it was just we were in such awe, you know, like, I mean, it was just like, um, venues that we'd heard about for, you know, since before Max even met, you know, we had tape rating fly, you know, gotten flyers of these venues that were still there, you know, that we, that we played. It's like, what so the fuck? cool. Yeah. <laughs> wow, man. I was yeah. going to ask you where the coolest place the band took you. I'm, I'm guessing, is it Japan? I would say so. Yeah. 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 Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. And you know, the friends that we made through those tours and then bringing bands from Japan to the West coast that we supported, those are like my lifelong friends. So not only the friends that, you know, like Dan and Chris, uh, but also the, the plutocracy dudes and all the people from our local scene, but then these international tape traders and pen pals that, I mean, they, to this day, I still see them when I travel to Japan, I consider them like my closest friends. And, you know, I, I, I just think about like how much that has influenced my life and, um, you know, made me who I am today, you know, and I'm so thankful to have that opportunity. Fuck. Yeah. It's so, it's so much like skateboarding. I mean, you go, you have travelers come to your hometown and you take good care of them because you know, they're going to take good care of you when you're in their town, yeah. you know, and it's, it's such a community that you build and, uh, you know, we were talking about it, not to get too dark or whatever, but like with everything that's going on right now, like I feel like skateboarding and music, especially DIY style music is, I'm not going to say there's no racism in it, but it's just such a, a melting pot of all types of people that 
I just feel like we never really thought about like, oh, that guy's Mexican or he's black or he's Asian. He was a skateboarder and he was trying to learn how to do a kickflip with us, you know, and yeah. we're on the same mission. We're going to go see fucking RKL in Santa Barbara, but we don't know how we're going to get there. Like whatever it was. And uh, I just wish the world could be a little bit more like that. You know, it seems like hopefully these protests are going to help something, but I don't know. Do you guys, you, you, you're in Vermont, Max, right? Is it, yeah. it's, it's wild out there or what? Well, I mean, not as, n not as off the hook as other places, but um, you know, it's, it's a good, so I'm in Burlington, which is a college town. Okay. And you know, it's a town of like, you know, book chin had his anarchist commune you know in vermont this is you know bernie sanders was the mayor in the 80s so there's a good socialist uh libertarian in the, in the good sense kind of uh you know uh streak here and so um you know it's it, it, it it's an interesting place and even for a small town it's got you know uh good politics and uh, or at least enough good politics to keep things in check, you know, but there's, uh -huh. you know, but, you know, we still have problems with police violence and, you it's know. It's insane that that stuff's still going on. Like you said, like when the yeah. band was going, it was Rodney King. That's, yeah. what, 30, so long ago. Yeah, yeah. I was so, actually, oh, sorry. No, go for it. Dive in there, dog. <laughs> I was talking actually with my wife last night you know, about how the, the community aspect of both skateboarding and music and how, you know, in spaz, it totally overlapped and went hand in hand. You know, it's like, if we weren't jamming, we were skating. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, <laughs> and, for sure. And that I always, you know, we're really lucky to have experienced that, especially like pre-internet social media and all this, you know, way that now it can be manipulated. I mean, we had this community where you could really kind of like be yourself you know and it was a uh, it was like a sanctuary for for weirdos and you know people exactly. that that yeah. that couldn't fit into society you know but you hop on a skateboard during the day hit some spots you know go home shower go to the show that night you know i mean it was just it it just all went together and you know like you were saying how you know everything on the peninsula made you who you are i mean waiting at a skate jam in Palo Alto when I was like, you know, in elementary school to take a run and hit the ramp, you know, I mean, that, that taught me about my, you know, how to be a better person, you know, and respect yeah. everything, you know, and yeah. to be like, you know, to be more assertive, like you're not going to exactly. get some unless you get some and just yeah. like whatever it was. I remember older know? dudes being like, come on, man, you just got to go. You just got to go, you know, because yeah. I, I, you know, I'm an only child. So I didn't have like a older sibling to kind of help me along with really anything. And, you know, I latched on a crazy pop, hardcore punk, figured it out myself. Thrasher yeah. Magazine was a huge help, you know. For sure. And then, uh, you know, I, I latched on to skateboarding and it was just, you know, man, Thrasher Magazine was, <laughs> was so huge for me, not really knowing anyone, you know? I was yeah. the guy who, who got my friends into skating. You know, <laughs> I was that kid. <laughs> right. Oh, man, dude, such good times. What, anything that sticks out in, in the, you know, San Mateo County, basically, as like, I was thinking of like hot spots, like uh, Hanley's Rock was like kind of a little hidden spot where we would go party, uh, there was like that little under the bridge up in San Mateo at the catwalk. There was oh, just, Oh yeah. Yeah. There was spots where like when you, you were trying to get like your party on, you would go and you just like do some pretty crazy shit. Like dude, the catwalks, that place was gnarly. Yeah. I, I was super scared. The first time I went there, I was like, are you serious? We're going to walk out on this thing, man. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's that right. Like, by you know that house that's like on the hill that looks kind of like the Flintstones. It's like cement round. Yeah. It's kind of right by the Father Sarah st statue pointing out. Yeah. yeah, it's like right there. Um, I don't know. Did you? What were the skate shops? Did was Go Skate there or was it uh, All Skate or? Yeah, it was Go Skate. I used to go to uh, Surf Check in San Carlos. Oh yeah. Fuck, I forgot about that. <laughs> and that there was, was uh, one in Redwood City called Sea Level. Yep. Over yeah. there by Mel's Bowl. Um, and then Palo Alto Sports Shop. 
Did that? Is, that was my place. That's where I went the, because my that's mom. That's where would, writer worked. No. Okay, my mom would you know take me because I was so young, and and that was a lot more inviting atmosphere for her than a ghost gate. Yeah, but uh, I like Ghost Gate because I get in there and it was just oh, I was oh, grimy. Yeah, Larry's you know, had... back there burning weed and fucking. <laughs> my just mom's just like full oh Rasta my God. beats everywhere <laughs> and fucking Chad's like, let's go to Miley for an hour. We could sneak out like this. So those were the days. We had a little quarter pipe. I worked at Ghost Gate from I don't know for a few years, probably like ninety to ninety five four four. I don't know somewhere around there, but uh, or maybe it was late eighties. I don't know. It all blends together. But. Did, did you did you overlap with uh, Fedge? Oh yeah, he's a yeah. homie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He worked there at the end of me starting. I think he. Yeah, um, but I was there with like Oscar Polchowski, Mike Alcantar, Nick Bancroft, Chad, and Larry. That was our crew. And do you remember that guy Terrell? Wow. Is a black guy and he stuck a whole like 62 millimeter wheel in his mouth. I think there was a something else, a thrasher. <laughs> <laughs> he was our homie too. It was so crazy. He had like an unlock jar or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. That was crazy. So, and like record stores, what record stores? We had uh, Rod's Record, San Carlos, Vinyl Solution, I think was yeah. Yeah. tale. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned Palo Alto. That was kind of like a little cooler. Palo Alto was like, you're kind of stepping it up going down there. They had a better <laughs> final solution was pretty good though. They they had some, they had like punk sections and like sections that were like, well, you know, stuff that spoke to us. The tower um, records were really big cause they had imports. Right. Mountain yeah. View so like, and San Mateo. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So that's yeah. where, you know, I got like, carcass and napalm death albums and you know bolt thrower you know like i was just kind of cutting my teeth on the earache stuff that i was picking up there you know prior to meeting max right so would you say that a lot of the music that you were getting into was word of mouth like through dudes that you respected like oh this guy likes this so i'm gonna check it out or was it more the zines for me it was a lot of zines you know and also just this looks fucking nuts I'm going to okay. buy it. <laughs> you know? Right. Like I saw aggression. I didn't even know what it was, but it was skating on the cover. And at that time, yeah. nobody's putting skating on the cover. It's like, these are one of us. No brainer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I used, I used to take the bus down to uh, tower records, Mountain View and go skate the bricks that were at the town center, the brick right. banks. And then, um, Oh, Dude, you know, that you, curb that was down there. Yeah, like the across Sears at the curb, old mill or whatever, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and, sick. And the, um, you know, the Tower Records, not only would you go off the cover, but you'd flip it over and how many songs were on the back probably meant that it was pretty fast. So, right. you know, like whether it was speed metal or whether it was like fast hardcore, like I would just be like, ooh, man, there's like 20 songs on this. I bet it's going to be pretty good, you know? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so that was like a old buying tip, you know, for me, like just being this like little Grom being like, Oh, I want to get some more thrash, you know? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I meet Max and his record collections. Crazy. Oh, really? Do you so still like, have I a was, huge one? <laughs> I mean, it was crazy, man. Got rid of him? I got rid of him. You know, I saved every flyer. You know, I, I, I used to peel after the shows were done. I used to peel flyers off the telephone poles, like all around oh, Palo Alto and Mountain View. So I had all the old varsity theater flyers. I, I, I saved every varsity or I saved every flyer that I ever got, you know, whether somebody was writing a letter on the back of it or, or whatnot. And, um, and then in the early 2000s, once I d decided to go into graduate school and move out to the East Coast, um, I couldn't. I had no place to put the stuff and I, I finally had to make the decision. I was like, shit, man, I can't, I can't um, manage this anymore. Unfortunately, you know, it just got like too big, you know? And what do you do? Do you sell them all at bulk or do you sell them? How did you get rid of them? Well, you know, at that time was right when eBay had started and I didn't want to do eBay because I kind of, you know, for, for so long being a record collector, there were dudes who, you know, you're waiting in line for a record store to open. And then some guy, when the record store opens, you're walking towards the new arrival use section and some guy jumps in front of you to go rummage through it. And what he's doing is he's reselling it for his store. 
you know, so he's rummaging through the DIY punk yeah. store. That's all volunteer run like Epicenter to then sell in his store for profit. You know, right. and I got, I got so tired of those kinds of ethics that when I had my used record collection and I was trying to think of how to get rid of it, I didn't want to sell it on eBay because at that time I felt like eBay was driving the prices up and was like unethical. I mean, it's more nuanced and ambiguous now, but um, at the time I was like, so I was trying to sell it to people that I knew. So I would just be like, dude, come over. You know? a bunch. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> and, and still I couldn't even do it that way. So I had to do some bulk, you know, to like Amoeba, there was some eBay broker, you know, who had oh. helped me out, you know, there, there was all this, this stuff, but I mean, it, it took, it took years, man. Is there a regret? Oh, sure. You know, because yeah. <laughs> I mean. I've been on the fence because it's, as you say, like, it's super hard to move around. Like I moved in with my fiance and now we got a smaller space for two and it's so those things, but you're like, dude, I'm, this is stuff that maybe if there is opportunity to get it again, I might not be able to get it again. Yeah. yeah. Like the, like the punk records, especially like, I don't, you know, maybe discogs, but like for way too much or whatever, but yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Fuck. So was yeah, that, how many was it about <laughs> more I mean, than 500? Oh yeah. Ooh. I mean, we're, no, we're talking like maybe 10, 10,000 maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yo, yeah, yeah. His I collection mean, was like, Really like a deep, whole room. Man. Yeah. I mean, your, I, he had a shirt collection, like bananas. Man. I do got rid of all the flyers yeah. too. Flyers and everything. And you know, what's crazy. Yeah. I wish so, I knew you then. <laughs> so I sold, I sold my zines and flyers to this guy who had a used zine store in, in San Francisco in the mission. And, and, you know, he was like, I'll just take everything for like 200. And I was like, that's fine because you're going to help out my parents. It was in their garage, you know? Okay. He sold it to UCLA, and now there's an archive with my name on it oh, of the sick. Mac, the Max Ward Power <laughs> Violence archive. And I didn't even know people like wrote to me. They're they're, they're like, "Yo, dude, you got an archive?" And I was like, "Whatever." I thought they were joking and shit, and like they're it was real. And I was like, "Is clowning?" Yeah, I was. I couldn't believe it. I was like, "Holy shit!" He sold it to UCLA, man. Hey, oh, do you guys have a few minutes to wrap it up? We have to do one more uh, break. It's uh, less than a minute. And so I'll re-invite you and then we can kind of just wrap it up. Sounds, Sounds good, man. Sounds oh, yeah. good. Okay, thanks. Hey, it's Corey at Blue Plate, 3218 Mission Street. Come see us. Meatloaf, fried chicken, deviled eggs, Dollar Olympia beers. We're here every day of the week. We got a garden and we got smiles on our faces. Come let us make you happy. Okay, okay, okay. Now we are about to give away. We're going to pick winners this week for the Jeff Rowley skateboard and a pair of shoes from Vans. Uh, we got a bunch of names. Thank you to everybody that uh, put the time in to contribute to the contest. And we're going to pick two winners out of the Talking Schmidt hat. And we have our executive director to do the honors. So here we go. Winner number one. This is going to be for the pair of Vans shoes. And the winner is... Sean Sanford of San Francisco, California. Sean Sanford gets a pair of shoes from Vans. Email me your size and... Uh, address and we'll be sending them off to you buddy and now for the big winner of the freedom skateboard deck signed by last week's guest jeff rally and the winner is maurice herboka from seattle washington maurice herbeka from Seattle, Washington. All right, congratulations and thank you. It looks like the giveaways are going to be coming in hot. Just got off the phone with the nice people of Derby, San Francisco, and we're going to be giving away a jacket from Derby in the upcoming weeks. We also have video games from Tony Hawk that we're doing. So the fun never ends here, kids. <laughs> Don't run!
Bobo! Where's my son? Where's my son? Where's what? We got the new sauce! Punk rock! Yeah! New kick! New flavor! Mot sauce! Is here! Step up to the plate and lose. Like Hitler, the German Shepherd coming down from the Bronx. Fight moose, you sound as soft as a goose. Shaboom! All right, so uh, where are we now? Tank Crimes re-released some of your guys' stuff. Is that right? Yep. Yes. With the six two five. Yeah, I, w- I wanted to get the um, the LPs, so kind of the standalone LPs back in print, and particularly in vinyl format and stuff. So I- I've been trying to keep those in press and um, uh, you know for relatively inexpensive and also just to keep it within the family. So we had kind of control over it. And then, uh, and then Scotty from tank crimes offered to do full releases of a lot of the collection CDs that had come out and Scotty's like family. So I think all of us were like, you you, can trust it. Yeah, exactly. And like, he'll, he'll do it right. And, and, uh, and yeah. And so is that that digital or is that vinyl as well? So just CDs on vinyl. On vinyl, yeah. Oh. Oh, mm. fuck. So did the band kind of get bigger after it was not a band anymore? Uh, yeah, you know, it's pretty funny. I, somebody was telling me, they were trying to explain. I love it when people help me understand myself and my history, you know? And so like, some, somebody was like, you, you, you know what Spaz has become? An entry-level band. You know, like you're the band that some kid, you know, who's probably like listening to like Blink-182 or something, and then they see somebody with like a spaz patch, and they're like, oh, or Charles Bronson, like, you know, one of those two bands. And then they pick it up, and then they get introduced into this whole world, and, you know, to be humble, of much better bands than spaz, but, you know, then, uh. then they, they enter into this scene, right? You know, and I was like, you know, I was like, okay, I understand that. Like, it's, it's like a name now, you know, and like, um, uh, yeah, just a way I think for people to just kind of get turned on to this kind of more kind of extreme style of music, but we're kind of like a gateway, you know, into that or something. And it seems, yeah, I mean, I, I can't believe people are still into it. You know, it's pretty crazy. I never thought. <laughs> kind of the flip. The flip yeah. side to that, though, is it got bigger than we anticipated, and it kind of got a little too big, and we weren't really paying attention, so there was a lot of bootlegs starting to oh. happen, and you know, we've been, over the past few years, really trying to control like merchandise, you know, um, because it became a band where it's like, Oh, I'm going to start a bootleg shirt company. So I'm going to do negative approach and right. I'm gonna do discharge. I'm going to do spaz. You know, it's like, what did you and guys have a copyright or trademark on that stuff? No, no, <laughs> not, not really. Yeah. Um, so is it tricky? It has, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we have a, couple things set up like you know it's like if scotty's putting handling the digital and the cds you know then he's invested in trying to recoup his money there so if he finds somebody who's jeopardizing that then he can go say hey you know you don't have the rights to do this 
Right. Um, yeah. Huh. You know, it's it's not like big business, you know, so it's not like the copyrights and lawyers and all that kind of thing. But there is a pretty interesting thing that happened where uh, that clothing company Supreme, you know, like really just kind of stole one of our images um, and, and kind of repurposed it as a Supreme image. And it was kind of like, whoa, that's crazy, you know? Yeah. Um, and that was kind of for me. When, when somebody sent me that, I was like, whoa, okay, this, this has become, you know, more than just tape trading, record trading type stuff, you know? Whoa, which image was that? Uh, it was like a Bruce Lee. I mean, we had stolen, <laughs> really, <laughs> the image for, first. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but it was just the way it was laid out and the font, I mean, it was identical. Oh, okay. you know, it was obviously you know, done as a, as a nod or whatever or rip of spaz, but it just kind of made me be like, Whoa, you know, we're, we're like maybe part of pop culture now in, in a broader sense than just like hard underground, hardcore punk, you know? Do you think that the name spaz is a big part of it? Like why are people drawn to it later? Do you think like, is there something that comes out in that? Like, I think it was in a, uh... It was in that movie with Mark Gonzalez, right? Gummo? It's on we're on the soundtrack. Oh, we're the not sound- in the film, but the soundtrack oh. was really hard to get. Okay. I think it really was just, you know, the ability to listen to stuff on YouTube and, you know, basically like Right. The, Once the availability digital world hit, you start going in rabbit holes and Okay. Yeah, it's like, oh, here's this band that doesn't have a digital presence, you know? So it's basically fans uploading stuff. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it's like kind of the, that generation's tape trading. But okay. then it's like being done on a corporate platform where you, people can monetize videos and you start getting into this kind of, hey, you know, maybe we need to take a little more control over this and you know it's like we're for the kids but at the same time it's like you know i don't want you know it 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 bums me out to see people you know printing up a shirt that looks like shit that has my band that has some artwork that you know i designed for my band on it you know it's like why don't we do it properly you know yeah yeah (laughs) yeah i i think it's funny that you know now and this goes with skate culture too that there's a certain kind of authenticity attached to an aesthetic that was from the eighties and nineties that was before digital. And so like all the stuff, Dan and I spent so many Saturday nights at a Kinko's down on El Camino Real with glue sticks and scissors and, you know, photocopying stuff to make it look like crap and then cutting it out or ripping it out and gluing it down for all the flyers. And like now that, you know, becomes, kind of an aesthetic that is trying to be replicated in a digital, you know, yeah. way or something, you know, but it, it, it's just mind boggling. I, I can't even get like my head around, you know, where things have kind of gone. And again, how popular the band has gotten, whether it's just a name or if like people actually really do like the band, I'm just like, I'm, I'm surprised by it all. You right. Know? Interesting. So, yeah. Huh? Well, shit, what's going on in, in your guys' worlds today? Um, you're in Vermont, you're teaching? Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I teach at a college, and so I'm uh, basically a professor of Japanese history. So I, like, research. Oh, hey. Yeah, I research and write on um, modern Japanese history and teach that, and um, trying to, you know, it's, it's – it's been a long road with within that you have to work really, really hard to basically secure a job in that realm. And so once I was able to do so, like I've been able to kind of turn back and think about like reconnecting with bands and reconnecting with band mates and mm. checking out new bands and trying to support like new bands. So like now I'm kind of like reconnecting, but it's been, you know, almost 15 years of being purely in academia. Hmm. Do you get no. to go to Japan as a write-off then for your work? Yeah. And, and so actually, actually the, the scene that I'm most involved in, the scene that I'm most involved in is, is the Tokyo scene. Of course. Yeah, so yeah, I've seen more shows in Tokyo over the last two decades than I've seen any place else. And, uh, and you know, my closest punk friends are, are, are there. So, yeah. And you're still doing the six, two, five. 
Yeah. And in fact, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do it properly because, you know, again, I came out of the 20th century. So I was like, you know, glue, glue aesthetics and like yeah. you know, put out a vinyl record. And now, you know, somebody told me the other day, like, if you don't have social media, like you don't exist. And he was totally right. And so like I started an Instagram and next thing I know, like people are writing me and contacting me and, you know, and, um, and we're doing hard foul, which is Dan's new band, these bastards split, uh, EP and cassette tapes coming up and just trying to do, you know, reconnect and kind of do things properly. But I'm still kind of like learning what that means within the 21st century. Right. All right. Well, you if know. you guys want to do re-release of Dirty and the Donuts, I got the masters. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, and Dan, are you still doing uh, hip hop stuff? Yeah. Yeah, How's I still do it. Uh, pretty good. Um, I got a group called Grand Invincible. It's me and uh, Luke Sick from Sacred Hoop from Palo Alto. And uh, we've been doing that since... I don't know, maybe like 2007 or something. Rad. Uh, we, we finished a new album and that's going to be out on uh, Iron Lung Records, uh, hopefully like in October or so. Mm. Um, and then I do beats for all sorts of people, man. I mean, I, you know, I'm kind of for hire. If somebody hits me up, wants something for an album and I've done projects with like, you know, me and Eddie K from, uh, from Frisco did a project uh, like last year and um I actually oh I have another project called Dank Goblins yeah and dude the split uh, the split with healers sick <laughs> yeah so sick. that's like that's more of an instrumental thing um oh. a friend of mine in Vegas plays drums and he sends me drum tracks and then I chop them up on my MPC and then I might add a sample or something from a record. And then I send it to my buddy, Frank, who plays bass. He's in hard foul, plutocracy, agents of Satan. Send it to him. He puts bass on it, sends it back to me. And then Luke Sick is also kind of a, a noise artist. Um, and he will add samples and stuff. So we actually are working on an album right now. Oh, okay. Um, that, that's probably going to, it's going to come out next year. Fuck um, yeah. What, what was that thing? Did you listen to KFJC on Sunday night? So it was like Kevy Kev or somebody. Oh, right? yeah. KZSU, the, man. The yeah. drum. KZSU. The yeah. drum. Yeah, so, yeah. dude, he does a Instagram live mix every every day. Oh, really? At like 6 or 7 p.m. in his basement. Fuck. So yeah. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Oh, that, man. that was huge, man. And, I mean, that so was like big. during Spaz, too. It was like yeah. – uh, that was a something I was listening to, you know, tape it and then listen to it all week and then tape the next one. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, they had a hip hop tapes. and then they had a punk version too. Yeah. And that's, you would just gobble that shit up. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great resource for finding new things and things that were going to, you know, last the test of time and all that. Like, yeah, we're pretty blessed for that. I, I, I like it better. I think as, a oh, good way to stay social too, instead of just be stuck to your monitor all day and all that stuff. Yeah, totally. I don't know. Um, and then Chris, he's no use for a name. He wasn't he, no use for a name. He was. Yeah. He was one yeah. of the founding guys. What's he doing now? He's got a band called Trappist. Trappist. Down in LA. Uh, oh, they he, put out an album maybe a year or two ago on uh, relapse. I'm not really sure what else he's doing musically. He was singing for um, To The Point. Oh, yeah, and, To The Point. And he um, he had also, he was playing in just a, a gazillion L.A. bands for a while. I mean, he, he was, was playing Infest. bass for Infest and and stuff. But, um, yeah, so he's in L.A. and just staying, like, super active and creative. He's you know, got he a never... pretty funny podcast, too. Really? Uh, called uh, Hour of the Barbarian. Okay. And that's basically the Trappist guys do okay. do a podcast too so they're like a band and a podcast i'm really into podcasts right now i've been like i get up super early like without an alarm and i go on like an hour walk every morning and i just listen to like usually bill burr on mondays because he has a <laughs> one every monday and then the rest of the week i'm either listening to i i was like 
super attached to the news for a while. And then I realized like, this isn't good for my depression. Like yeah. my yeah. Xanax uh, prescription was going through the roof. I had to like <laughs> <laughs> mellow out the levels, but yeah. no, the podcasts are cool. They kind of feel like retro, you know, like it feels more like, I don't know. It's close to a radio show and like that old vibe. So I've been loving it, dude. It's I'm stoked you guys came. Um, any other shout outs or anything we need to uh, kind of mention in closing? Um, rest in power to Andrew Huber out in Wisconsin. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. I God mean, we, 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 yeah, we lost a skater there. So, you yeah. know, I mean, ho hopefully skaters recognize like, whether you choose a side in this or not, like your choice, your side has been chosen, you know? So I listened to a lot of radio the next day on that stuff. And one of the things that was really powerful for me that I listened to was whether you wear a mask or where you don't wear a mask shouldn't be Republican or Democrat. It should just be a value. And for me, I was like, I think it's uh, Wisconsin, right? And yeah. Like he was around the cops and they were just like, yeah, dude, you need some water? Are you, are you thirsty? Like that is insane. So insane that I feel like we're not in 2020 and we're not in the United States. Those were my first two reactions. Like I got in some crazy time warp and I'm in like the middle of fucking, I don't even know where, dude. That was shocking. Yeah. I mean, we're in weird times, you know, and even the specialists who are supposed to, you know, understand these things are also all just kind of scratching their heads as far as, you know, how we got to this point. And, uh, yeah, it's crazy. But, you know, again, I, kind of going back to one of the earlier points that we were talking about, it's important, you know, to like have these kinds of communities through skateboarding, which is international, you know, it, it doesn't come down to national identity or citizenship or whatnot. It's just, you know, for the love of, of, you know, doing it and supporting each other and same with punk, you know, and hardcore and hip hop and you right, know, a brotherhood. Yeah, exactly. You know, and so, you know, every scene's got its problems, of course, but you know, this scene can work it out a whole lot better than, you know, society at large and stuff. So, I mean, it's just a really important time to kind of maintain these kinds of, you know, relationships and communication and supporting each other and checking in on each other and stuff like that, you know? So I want to say a uh, shout out to all the skaters that listen to spaz and kids that put spaz in their little homemade video clips and send them to me on Instagram. I mean, that Sick. shit gets me pumped, man. You know, Rad. Like what's if, your Instagrams? Uh, I'm Dan Lactose at Dan Lactose on Instagram and Twitter. Okay, hit me up, man. If you want to put spaz in your skate video, hit us up, man. We're <laughs> we're a hundred percent, you know, Red. about that, you know. What's your you're now you're on Instagram, Max? Yeah, I'm at six two five underscore thrash. It's just it's just the label, so it's not oh. actually like me me personally, but just trying to kind of get the label and you know, info out, but you know, Chris is on there too with slap a ham records and stuff. So if anybody's interested, uh, you know, hit us up Instagram or email or whatnot. Yeah. All right. Well, usually on this show, the way we end it is we have the guest pick a track that we roll off into the sunset listening to, but I'm thinking you both need to pick a track and if there are only 10 seconds or something, we might have to pick a few tracks. Because <laughs> we got like a 30-second uh, credits reel, so it's going to oh, be okay. 30 seconds. Is there limits to this? Or do, or no, we, do we have to pick a spaz thing? Or do no, we have to pick a spaz thing? No, you can like, do whatever you want. I mean, there's so many, man, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I definitely yeah. want to play a spaz song, so maybe you could uh, you know, suggest one and we can put it even during the interview at some point. I know Dan's got five. <laughs> I'm just like looking at all these records here, man. Like it's overwhelming. Yeah. I was going to say like JFA, the great equalizer. That's a great song. Mm -hmm. Good, good skate, hardcore song. But yeah, I mean, if it's spaz, Dan, I'll, I'll let you. Uh, well, going make, make through all this old spaz stuff, you know, I, I rediscovered uh, a song that, that I think is my favorite song. And it's that uh, Redenbacher, Orville Redenbacher's uh, Orgy of Hate, Fear, 
and destruction or I can't remember <laughs> the song title necessary uh pestilence something like that all right i love hey i'm a i'm a fuck i don't know if there's a bigger fan than me of popcorn i eat popcorn <laughs> every night me too I, me, me too me too every fucking <laughs> night with my me lunch too. every if day i don't I, have popcorn always... one day it's super weird do yeah, you have yeah. a whirly pop I have like so many different ones. I have this one. My girlfriend got me. It's like a rubber one that you put the kernels in and you put it in the microwave if you're like, you know, but uh, Alyssa Steamer gave me this insane recipe that you do from scratch with like uh, coconut oil. Coconut oil, man. Fucking, that's the secret. You know what? The key is, is nutritional yeast. Yeah. Yeah. Yum. 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 <laughs> <Done. laughs> They might have to do a part two about uh, popcorn recipes. Hey, huge fan. I made a <laughs> tutorial with Alyssa. Like, we filmed the whole how to make popcorn. It was oh, great. That's sweet. Oh, man. But, yeah, we'll get Orville Re Redenbacher because I'm looking for that Orville Redenbacher sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully this doesn't uh, screw that up for you. I'm sick of that. <laughs> Sponsored by popcorn. Done. Yeah. yeah. I was also thinking, I mean, if you want another one, uh, you know, a, a band that influenced us when we were first starting out was Siege. And they have a song called uh, Break Down the Walls. Oh, okay. The walls. Is it called Walls? That's where we're at right now, man, in, in, the, in the world, you know? Yeah, yeah. No. Is there a place you can go if you can't, for, you know, for some people that can't understand the lyrics, is there a place that you can go to read what's being <laughs> um discussed there might be some fan stuff but you know there's no online spaz lyric resource. i think that would be a good uh like a uh giveaway no. the first person that can give me the lyrics to this song wins a fucking there you go i could come up go. with the prize a spaz patch <laughs> <laughs> awesome. uh, fuck yeah thank you guys um Max, if you ever come to uh, the Bay Area, hit me up. Let's all fucking get together. Um, hopefully, this uh, there's no light at the end of the tunnel right now, but I think once there is a light, it's going to come in fast, and we're going to be out of here quick. So I'm hoping I'm sure for hope just so. yeah. I think it's going to be like that. I think you're going to everything's going to seem bleak, and then one day the news is going to be like, hey, these guys figured it out. It's uh, A S D F G H J up down left right B A star. <laughs> you know. No, let's hope. Let's hope. Fucking hell, Wolf. Yeah, there thanks, Schmitty, for kids. doing it, yeah, man. Yeah. This is yeah, thank you, Schmitty. Yeah. This right, is healthy cheers. too. Mental health, right here. You know, connecting I, with some homies. You know, absolutely. Hey, thanks, man. That was great. I had a great time. Yeah. Thanks, thank dude. you. Yeah, yeah, Cheers thanks. And good yeah. luck out in Vermont. And Dan, let's fucking cross paths more often. That's crazy. I, so, I forgot man. about uh, Aurora at the Aurora. Oasis. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Oasis All right. is gone. <laughs> All right, guys. Take care, huh? Yeah, hey, thank you. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Be well. You too. Peace. Thank you for listening to another episode of Talking Schmidt. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. When you subscribe, You'll get notifications every Tuesday of new episodes the minute they become available. Also, please leave reviews in a five-star rating. It's the best way to help the show grow. All of the episodes will always remain free, but if you would like to help support the show, you can do so at TalkingSchmidt.com, where you can pick up some merchandise like t-shirts, beanies, hats, and stickers. The website has an entire archive of all of the episodes, with extra photos and videos. Email us with any suggestions, comments, or ways that the show may have improved your life at talkingschmidt at gmail.com. All interviews are conducted, edited, and produced by Schmitty. The intro music is Mary's Cross by the band Nature. Very special shout out goes to the executive director, Cheryl Camisa. Shout out. Love it! This is Talking Schmidt, where the Rolodex is deep, but the conversation is deeper.